Hi everyone and welcome to another crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of John Thomas Blair and the murder of Margaret Redden which took place at Newcastle upon Tyne in 1900. I hope you will find it interesting. This case has a lot less witnesses and evidence than usual so it will be a lot shorter than those of the past couple of weeks. But before we begin, can I just say, if you do enjoy this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you are new here or haven't already done so, then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. And I would just also like to add that I do record these stories live, so I do sometimes make mistakes, which I always try to rectify. So I hope this does not spoil your enjoyment of the video. John Blair was born in Spennymoor in around 1878 to parents William and Mary, and he was one of at least four children. His father was a tailor, and John also followed this trade. In 1899, however, John enlisted in the Northumberland Fusiliers and was stationed at what later became known as the Fenham Barracks in Newcastle. He was described as being around 5 foot 4 inches tall with light brown hair and brown eyes and he was around 22 years old at the time the crime was committed. Margaret Redden, the victim, was born in Newcastle in around 1881 to parents Jane and David and was one of at least four children and she was also the twin sister of Elizabeth. Her father had left, though no reason is given as to why, and his whereabouts are unknown, and her mother is now bringing up the children on her own. And Margaret lived with her mother and worked as a char lady, or in other words, she was a cleaning lady. She was around 19 years old at the time of her murder. On January the 31st, 1900, Elizabeth Smith, also known as Lizzie, went to call on her friend Margaret Redden at her home in Newcastle and the two girls set out for a walk. They also planned to meet up with a couple of soldiers who they had met before and these were Private Blair and Private Curry. They met the two soldiers at the Waterloo Public House in Bath Lane. Here they had a couple of glasses of beer each before deciding to leave and head off in the direction of the barracks. They all seemed to be happy court and couples and at 10.30pm Elizabeth called over to Margaret to ask if she was going home but she said no. So Elizabeth left leaving Margaret alone with John. A short time after this John Blair entered the barracks in what seemed to be an agitated state. He at first seemed to be going to his quarters but then returned to the guard at the door saying, I have done it. The guard asked what he had done and he replied by saying, I have killed a lass by kicking her. The guard at once sent a message to his commanding officer and he in turn sent for the police. John Blair was locked in the guard room until they arrived. The police officer and the police doctor found the body of a young girl in the location close to the barracks, exactly where John had said she would be. They could see at once that she was already dead and had been subjected to a most brutal attack. Her body, after examination, was removed to the mortuary in Newcastle, which was still at this time more commonly known as the Dead House. Afterwards, John Blair was charged with the willful murder of Margaret Redden, although it must be noted that they did not know the girl's name at this point, and John was taken to the police station. At first, John had made no comment, but on the way to the police station, he had asked if the girl was dead, and on being told that she was, he replied by saying, I have been with her three or four times before, and she has done me twice, meaning that she'd robbed him, and tonight she did it again, and I did for her. After being formally charged at the police station, he made no further comment. The inquest was held at the mortuary in Newcastle on February the 3rd, 1900. It was said that John Blair was at the time in Newcastle prison and was not present at the inquest. Margaret's mother, who gave her name as Rosetta, although her Christian name was actually Jane, said she had identified the body as being that of her 19-year-old daughter who lived with her in the same street area of Newcastle. She said Margaret made her living as a charwoman and that she had not been aware that her daughter had a sweetheart. 
She said Margaret's father had left them some six years earlier and she did not know where he was. She said that Margaret had gone out around 7pm on January the 31st with her friend Lizzie and she had not seen either girl again that night. And until Lizzie had called on her the following morning and asked where Margaret was, she had not been aware that she was missing, believing that she had just spent the night with her friend. Lizzie told her she had left her near Bath Lane, although this was not entirely true, as Lizzie would state later at the inquest. After this, Rosetta said she had heard gossip from the neighbours of a woman's body being found on the leases in Newcastle, and almost immediately she believed it must be her daughter. She at once went to the dead house where she identified the body as her own daughter. Elizabeth Smith said she was 17 years old and lived at Akenside Hill in Newcastle. She said she had known Margaret for around two years and they were often in the habit of going out for walks together at night. She said she had called on her on the night of the 31st and they had set up together for the Waterloo pub in Bath Lane where Margaret was to meet her young man. On entering the bar, they found the young man and his companion waiting for them. Elizabeth said she stayed in the company of Private Curry. They had two drinks together and then set off in the direction of the barracks. She said they left around 9.25pm. She said she did not leave Margaret at Bath Lane as they had walked from there to the barracks. She said on reaching the barrack walls, the two couples had separated. She claimed that she was not much interested in her companion and wanted to head home, but Margaret said she was not ready to leave. Elizabeth said she had left her with her companion and had walked left with her companion and he had walked her as far as Grey Street before leaving her on her own. She saw no more of Margaret after this and did not know what had happened to her until she heard of a body found near the barracks. The coroner said he believed that she knew more but was not willing or able to tell all and he had found getting the evidence from her to be quite difficult. Corporal Lee here said he was on duty in the guard room at the barracks on August the 31st when John Blair returned at around 11.40pm. He said he had appeared agitated and said, I have done it. At this point he said he did not ask what he had done and John had walked away as if going to his quarters, but had returned only moments later saying, I must do it, I must do it. Corporal Lee here said he found this odd, but John seemed sober, so he escorted him to his room, where John then took him by the arm and said, Believe me, Corporal, what I say is right, I have done it. This time he said he asked what he had done, and John had replied, I have killed a lass. He then said he asked how he had done this, and John said, By kicking her to death. Corporal Lee here said he had then locked him in the guard room and went to his commanding officer to tell him what he had been told, and he in turn had called for the police. Corporal Leeson and Sergeant Buswell both confirmed the statement of Corporal Lee here, expressing the opinion that John seemed sober but was at time making rambling statements. Sergeant Buswell added that John had said, I can tell you where the woman can be found. And Sergeant Buswell also said that he had examined the clothing worn by John Blair and he did not believe he had seen any signs of bloodstains. Hello, I did check several articles. I was not able to ever find any details of evidence given by Private Curry at the inquest or indeed later at the trial, nor did I find any reason as to why he did not testify. Dr. Baumgartner said he had been called to the barracks with the police at around 12.30am on February the 1st. He had gone with the police to the area behind the barrack walls where they had found the body of a young girl. Her face was stained with blood and some of her clothing seemed to be lying around her body and he knew immediately that she was dead. On February the 2nd he had performed the post-mortem and had found a bruise into various parts of her body which he felt could have been caused by a boot or a heavy shoe. There was bruising to the neck and in his opinion the cause of death had been strangulation and the other blows to the body he felt had been inflicted after she had already been dead. He did not believe that any of the injuries could have been caused by a person accidentally falling on top of another. Sergeant Barr said he had been called to the barracks with the doctor in the early hours of February the 1st. He said on finding the body he noted that the girl was lying face down on the ground and he knew at once that she was already dead. 
On returning to the barracks, he charged on with John with her willful murder. He had examined his clothes and, and believed there to be several small bloodstains on his coat. As they travelled to the police station, he said John had asked if the girl was dead and he had told him that yes, she was. John had then made the following statement. I have been with her three or four times before and she has done me twice. Tonight she was trying to do me again. She had her hand in my pocket and I did for her. I caught hold of her by the throat but I cannot think that I have done anything wrong. I left her lying on the ground and I went back ten minutes later to try and get her up but could not do so. I then went to the barracks. I don't know what I did it for. I was not drunk. The coroner stated this was a very clear case. The prisoner had confessed to the crime and it would be impossible to return any verdict other than guilty of murder. The jury at the inquest retired for only a few minutes before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder and John Blair was committed for trial. I did not find any details of a funeral for Margaret Redden, which is unusual, as when a young woman was murdered, there would often be a large coverage of the funeral, but perhaps in this case it was a small private affair and the papers were not made aware of it. I also did not find any indication of a headstone for Margaret anywhere in the area. The trial took place at the Moot Hall in Newcastle on February the 22nd, 1900. John Blair pleaded not guilty to the charge. This case, as already mentioned, had very few witnesses and most of the evidence given at the trial was the same as had been heard at the inquest. However, at the trial, John Blair was called to give evidence on his own behalf. John stated that on the night of the 31st of January, he had gone to the Waterloo pub with his friend Curry. He had not expected to meet Margaret there, although he did admit that he had told Elizabeth he would be there that night. He went on to say that he had been with Margaret twice before, and he had no argument with her and believed they were on the best of terms, which was quite strange considering he had previously stated that she had robbed him of money twice before. He said on leaving the public house they had had headed back towards the barracks in the direction of the town moor and when they got there he had been with margaret against the wall having relations as they called it in those days he claimed he then saw her put her hand into his pocket where he kept his money and on looking down he saw money in her hand he almost immediately took hold of her by the throat and she fell to the ground he said he then fell on top of her he had asked her for his money but she said she did not have it after this, he said she never spoke again. He said they were lying on the ground some two to three minutes and during this time he did not know what he was doing. He then went on to explain that he had a St. Vitus dance and that this sometimes made him act in an excited, uncontrolled manner. St. Vitus dance is an autoimmune disease that can cause rapid, uncontrolled movements of the face, hands and feet. John then said that he did remember kicking her and that he was standing up at the time, but it was dark and he could not see where he kicked her. He knew he had hurt her, but he did not plan to kill her. He also said that Margaret had dropped his money from her hand when she had fallen to the ground, and it was two shillings. When asked, he said he had never given her money previously, nor would he do so, and until this night there had never been anything immoral between them. Some character witnesses were called and Sergeant Fraser of the Northumberland Fusiliers said that since joining he had found John to be a quiet, inoffensive man who worked previously as a tailor by trade and had worked at this as in the barracks. Thomas Dodson said he was a tailor at Spennymoor and had known John all of his life. He was, in his opinion, a quiet, sober and steady man. He had never known him to show any signs of violence and James Dawson said he was a tailor at North Hills and that John had worked for him for two years. He said he was a steady, hard-working man and in fact he would be inclined to describe him as being a rather dull young man. The judge, in summing up, said the defence had done a very good job given the case in hand to show the prisoner as a quiet man not known for outbursts of anger while he was faced with a charge for the most brutal crime which did indeed seem out of character. He said the jury must decide if they felt that John Blair had intended to kill Margaret Redden 
or if he had acted in a moment of madness, brought on by rage at the thought of Margaret stealing from him. He continued by saying that he did not feel St. Vitus' dance was a reason for John's action, and nor did he feel that John's statement that he had fallen on Margaret had been the cause of any of her injuries. The judge ended by saying to be murder, there must be an indication that it was planned, but to be manslaughter, there must be provocation, and the stealing of money was, he felt, not provocation enough. The jury retired for 45 minutes before returning with a verdict of guilty of manslaughter against John Blair. The judge, addressing John Blair, said the jury had taken a merciful view of his case and it was not for him to say if it was a just one. He said John had been aware just moments after he had committed the crime just how terrible it had been and the fact that he had cruelly and brutally taken the life of a poor young girl was in no doubt but he would not take away from him the benefit with which the jury had blessed him, and for this he would sentence him to ten years' penal servitude. John was later sent to Portland Prison in Dorset, and it was from here that he was later released in 1907, having served only seven years of his sentence. However, this would not quite be the end of his story. He would again find himself in prison in Birmingham for a case of breaking and entering, for which he would serve six months with hard labour, and the final case of imprisonment that I found for him was in 1921, when he was given a sentence of 60 days, however the crime in this case was not mentioned. I did not find any further details for him after this. This was a very tragic case. Margaret was only 19 years old and it seems to me that she was killed for something so trivial as possibly stealing two shillings from a man who it seems had no control over his emotions and anger. He did not go on to lead a good life and spent more time in prison for other things after this, though I have to admit that I did not find any further murder charges for him. I also admit that the jury could not prove murder without premeditation and the verdict of manslaughter was the only one they could have come to, but the sentence of only 10 years was in my view too lenient, especially when we later find that he only served 7. Was that enough to pay for the life he took? Well, I don't believe that it was. But what do you think? Do you think he should have been given a much harsher sentence? Do you believe it was right that he was released just seven years later? And does his continued life of crime show that he was perhaps not the quiet, inoffensive man some believed him to be? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you found this sad and tragic story interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I would like to say that I have recorded this whilst recovering from quite a, a bad cold so I do hope that my voice doesn't sound too strange but if it does that is the reason why. Anyway I do hope to see you all again very soon.